uh, Jeremy, can you also uh, make Galina the co-host of the meeting? Uh, yes, she is currently a co-host. Okay, that's great. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the IFM session at the Sever Annual Conference. Um, I'm Galina Hale. I'm a director of the IFM program, and it's one of the few programs uh, that the Sebra has ongoing for uh, many years now. Um, in addition to hosting a session at each of the annual meetings, we also organize an annual Sebra IFM meeting. Uh, it's always co-organized with uh, one of the central banks so far. This year, we're going to have a meeting in October on uh, fintech and digital currencies, and that's co-organized with the European Central Bank. So please check sebra.org for uh, all the information and um, welcome to this session. Uh, Chen Yu Hu from uh, UC Santa Cruz is going to chair this session. I'm going to help her with the Q&A. Um, so, uh, if, uh, you are a panelist, you can just, uh, you know, if you have a question or comment, you can just speak. If you're an attendee, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. I will monitor that and, um, either just let you speak or read the question for you. That's going to depend on, um, you know, how many questions we have and also, uh, what our chair Chen Yu decides. Okay. Chen Yu, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Galina. Um, my name is Chen Yue, and it has been my great pleasure to co-organize the session with Galina. Today, we have four exciting papers uh, studying the implications of COVID for international finance. Each paper will get 20 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for the Q&A. I will keep track of time and send a message to the speakers when we reach the 20-minute limit. Um, the audience can type in the Q&A window uh, if they have any questions or comments. As mentioned by Galina, she and I will help directly questions to the speakers. Our first speaker will be Gabriel Mihalake. He will talk about the impact of COVID on solving debt crises. Gabriel, you can share the screen if you want. 
Hello. Um, thank you for uh, for having me. Do you see my slides now? Hello. Yes, I can see your slide. Oh, excellent. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you for uh, for for having me. This is joint work with Cristina Arellano and, and and Jan Bai, and this is on the sort of two-way interaction between the pandemic and, and fiscal space, broadly speaking. And of course, the usual disclaimer applies for, uh, for, for Christina. So I, I don't wanna belabor the point and try to sort of sell you on the idea that COVID is a very, very important shock, but, but uh, I do wanna emphasize that it, it comes with a large human, human cost. So we have some data here from late last year. And of course we should update this with more recent estimates. At the same time, there's a there's a large drop in economic activity, up to 30% drop in industrial production, which is large by by historic standards. But the 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 aspect that we we will focus most in this project is this idea that while in advanced economies, fiscal authorities could easily fairly easily engage in large transfer programs and and, and so on. Uh, when we think about emerging markets like Latin America, then there's going to be uh, more difficult because of the large informal sector and other and other fiscal fiscal uh, structural fiscal issues. And so we did see actually some some countries default, and we did see some some worsening of the of the terms of borrowing. And so so that's going to be our jumping off point here, where we're thinking about this interaction of limited fiscal space with the with the pandemic. And then we're going to use our model to evaluate um, debt relief programs, um, the, the type that the, the IMF and the World Bank has been has been championing. So, so we do want to start by proposing a framework where we have this sort of triple crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and a debt crisis. And of course, the, the interaction, it's, it's where, where all the, the interesting action will be, how, how these things <clears throat> interact. So we will have a sort of quantitative theoretical exercise where we will integrate um, sort of an explicit model of the of the infection. We're going to have one of these so-called SIR models, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And so that within the model, that's going to generate endogenously paths for the for the infection and fatalities and so on. And then we're going to think about um, policy choices in terms of mitigate, mitigating the, the infection. There's going to be an, an active choice of, of uh, engaging in social distancing, lockdowns, and, and, and so on. And at the same time, the, the fiscal authority will have the option to borrow internationally and possibly default in order to, to support consumption. So we will be interested in this question of how default risk limits fiscal capacity and what does that do for our choice of aggressively fighting fighting the infection. So there's going to be sort of two channels here, one from the, the, the recession and limited fiscal capacity to, to defaults. And then we're also gonna think about the consequences of, of these real um, problems in the sort of in the, in the fiscal sector, how they, they feed into uh, fatalities and otherwise just sort of mitigating the, the infection. And finally, what we will find, just to preview a bit the, the, the bottom line here, is that in an environment like this, we will find that debt relief poli policies will be extremely useful. So th there are some previous results in the literature that were somewhat skeptical of official assistance in debt relief. And what we show is that in a, in a richer framework where we do have a, a pandemic and so on, and these additional margins of adjustment, then it's, it's, very, it's very useful to, to engage in, in um, this type of debt relief official lending. So let me jump ahead a bit in the interest of time. I will show you the, the, the results um, on their own. So I do wanna go straight to the model and then the, the sort of the quanti quantitative analysis of the model. So we will look at a small open economy with preferences over consumption and, and saving lives. There will be this unexpected outburst of the, of the pandemic. So there's going to be an unexpected uh, outbreak. And then the epidemiological block of the model will will uh, will capture the evolution of the of the disease. And then we will look at the the problem of a fiscal authority that can borrow internationally, it can default, and it it will decide on lockdown. So where there's going to be a 
a continuous choice of lockdown intensity. And that's going to be one margin of choice where we're going to think about how that choice is distorted by, by fiscal conditions. So let me start with the with the preferences and the, the nature of the, the, the way we model infection. So we will have standard preferences over, over streams of consumption, but we also uh, have a term here that captures the, the uh, disutility from death. So whenever you have fatalities every period, then there's going to be a it's sort of a quasi-linear structure where each fatality incurs us, induces a certain utility cost. So that's how we're going to capture the, the statistical value of life. And of course, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the literature and sort of the precedence of people doing some of these things, but, but this is how we capture the value of life in the model. There's going to be production using labor subject to, to productivity. And in particular, when we come to this choice of lockdown, what lockdown does, it's, it's, it's basically telling people to stay away from the labor market, among other things. And so if, if I'm doing a lockdown at 50% intensity, then that it is equivalent to having 50% of the people uh, withdraw from the labor market. So the labor, the labor here is, is adjusted for the lockdown intensity. So one cost of locking down is that you are literally, you know, depressing the labor market and reducing your, your output. Then the epidemic will follow the, the sort of now all too familiar SIR dynamics. Everyone starts susceptible. This is the measure of susceptible individuals. Over time, due to new infections, some of them become infected. And eventually infections are resolved in either becoming recovered or deceased. And in particular, people become infected from being susceptible using this sort of quote unquote production function for new infections. So the way to think about it is that the, the currently infected bump into the currently susceptible. So it's a bit like a matching technology. And when they meet, they produce new, new infections. And then what I want to emphasize quite early on is that, as, as I mentioned, the cost of lockdowns is that you're foregoing labor input and therefore foregoing output. The benefit of lockdowns is that because you're telling people to stay away from, from public spaces, from work and so on, you will be reducing these new infections because if, if this measure of infected is, is out there in the labor market and then you, you, you tell a fraction of people or you, you, you impose a lockdown of certain intensity, then that's going to be a reduction of the effective exposure of the, of the susceptible to the infected. So there's another couple of small things I want to note here. You notice that we have this data parameter, which basically captures the fact that lockdowns are not perfectly effective. So even though you, you might tell people, you know, you, you cannot go to work, there will still be some transmission in the home or there might be some transmission in the grocery store. So lockdowns are, lockdowns are going to be imperfect in preventing new infections. And so that's why we have this data parameter here. And the other thing to note is that there's almost like an increasing returns flavor here because if, if I tell, if I, I basically tell both sides of the market to, to stay away from the market. So I'm telling the infected and I'm also telling the susceptible to stay at home. And so, so this is why this one minus theta L term shows up twice because a fraction of the infected are not in the market and a fraction of the susceptible are not there in the, in the market. So, so this is all very standard in, in this literature, but I do want to emphasize a bit the, the, the mechanics here of, of infection. And then eventually some of the infected will, will become fatality subject, to, subject to, a, to a function capture this with this phi D. And so the, the main takeaway is that lockdowns or social distancing will reduce infections and improve the outcome of the epidemic but at the cost of depressed output. And that's going to feed into the, into the fiscal authorities um, problem. On the, on the fiscal side, we're gonna look at a, at a fairly stylized environment with, with partial default. So I'm gonna explain why we're doing partial default and exactly how that works. So this is a, just for expositional purposes, I'm gonna restrict attention to short-term debt. In the paper, we actually do long-term debt, um, you know, to be more in line with the data, but I think this is easier to, to explain. So there's going to be 
we're going to we're going to look at this at a sort of consolidated centralized problem where the the government sort of decides everything and we're not going to emphasize the decentralization of those policies to to the private sector so so the government collects income in the form of gdp so this is going to be the 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 result of production using labor potentially subject to to lockdowns and then the government also collects resources by selling additional bonds. So Q will be the bond price and L is the new issuance of bonds. So this is sort of the resources that the government has. And then it's gonna use those resources for two things. One is private consumption. So we're, we, we're gonna have N people around and each of them consume C, right? So there's not gonna be any heterogeneity or inequality in, in, this, in, this, in this framework. And then the other use of funds is to service the debt. Right, so this is the outstanding debt and you, you can pay the outstanding debt. Here we give the government uh, a choice of default intensity. So unlike some previous work where you are used to thinking of default as being a yes or no choice, this is a continuous choice. So the government may choose to service only half of the outstanding debt and then not pay the other. What the, the other interesting aspect here is what happens with the debt you choose not to service, right? So it doesn't just go away. We assume that a fraction of it, this kappa fraction, potentially all of it, will be uh, accumulated as RARs. So we're capitalizing missed payments as RARs. And so in, in Christina's previous work, she, she shows that this, this structure has very nice, very attractive properties in terms of this slow accumulation buildup of RRs during default and how during default debt actually increases. So, so we, we are happy to, to use that, that structure because I think it captures something important about the debt overhang from the, from the RRs. And of course, the benefit of defaulting is that you, you choose not to service the debt. Of course, there also has to be a cost and here the cost is very sort of parsimoniously and reduced form captured by this idea that if you default with higher intensity, your productivity suffers, right? So this is a very reduced way of capturing that default induces some uh, dysfunction in your financial system or in your banking system. And then that in turn uh, worsens your, your ability to, to engage in production. Here we're just sort of cutting through that structure when direct, we're directly assuming that productivity is worsened by, by higher intensity default. And then we're just going to price this debt with, with risk neutral competitive lenders to have a very, very simple baseline. But before I move on, I do want to emphasize that this partial default approach has essentially the same, the same behavior as a standard default model. So all your intuition from the standard default model carries through. You're going to default more when you have more debt, when output is lower, and when you, when you get worse bond prices. So all the usual comparative statics carry, carry through. Good, so I'm gonna skip some of this. Of course, we're gonna formulate this into a, we're gonna formulate this like a Markov recursive recursive problem for the government. I, I don't wanna go a bit into this, this, this aspect, but there's going to be here two channels, which is um, the, the outbreak of the epidemic will induce a debt crisis with low output and default and, and sort of higher spreads. And at the same time, the debt crisis in turn will disincentivize the government to, en to engage in very tight lockdowns. So that's going to make mitigation of the pandemic costlier and it's going to result in, in a higher debt toll, right? So we have a sort of two-way interaction between fiscal, fiscal conditions and the outcome of the, of the pandemic. And in fact, we do we do show these two channels in a very sort of stylized two-period version of the model. You know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this, but it's it's in the in the paper we do make some of these um, incentives very very clear in a in a stylized model. So so again, we we sort of take this model. I'm just going to show you how we we take this to the data. Um, some of the parameters are going to be, we're going to rely heavily on the literature, some estimates from the epidemiology literature, we're going to rely on some, some, um, some of Christina's work on partial default and so on. So some of these are um, fairly standard. The, the ones that we're, we're fixing to the literature are, are largely un uncontroversial. 
we do have to take a stand on the statistical value of life and we do have a, a sort of extensive discussion of that in the paper how we how we think about this this value of uh, of life and the residual life and, and so on because the the age structure of the fatalities may may be relevant for for that calculation um, but you know, setting aside things that are fairly standard, at the end of the day, we will look for, for a small number of parameters that fit the, the data in a, in, a, in a similar way. So we're gonna look at the, the intensity of the lockdowns. We're gonna proxy this in the data with Google mobility data for Latin America. And uh, so that's gonna be our measure of lockdown intensity, uh, traffic in the workplace. And of course, we're going to do some sort of populated population average uh, measure for Latin America overall based on the available data. And then we're going to look at daily, daily deaths per, per 10,000 at a monthly frequency. And then the strategy will be to, to, to match the timing of infections and the timing of, of lockdowns in the data, as well as the initial debt to, debt to GDP. And then we get a, a fairly tight fit of the data. We do, we do assume that there is some exogenous evolution in the degree to which the, 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 the disease is infectious. That's gonna be essential for us to match this delay, this lag structure between the timing of lockdowns and the timing of, of deaths. So, but I, I, won't, I won't go into that into the, in the interest of time. So once we, we sort of get the right quantitative magnitudes in the model, we have a, the model has a, has a sort of induced time path for, for the deceased, the intensity of lockdowns, and then the intensity of the recession and the drop in consumption in this environment. So, so we do, this allows the baseline model to, to capture some key features of the data and at the same time um, make some forecasts going forward. The other thing we assume here for tractability is that after two years, we have some the arrival of a very effective exogenous vaccine that gives a sort of a terminal condition in the model. In, in the paper, we put push this back to three years and further and make the point that it doesn't really alter our, our results. How am I doing on time? Because I'm not super sure when we, when we started. You have five more minutes. Okay, perfect. So, so we have this baseline where we, we try to we try our best to capture what we saw in the data in, in 2020. And so I'm not gonna go through all through all the numbers and but that's sort of our baseline. So then we want to use this baseline for a couple of um, useful exercises, and that's what I want to use my, my remaining time for. Let me just say that in the paper we do we do simulate sort of a, the, uh, the arrival of a more infectious variant and a second wave. So we, this framework is flexible enough to capture some of the concerns and issues that we saw later in, in sort of in late 2020. So here it looks like sort of a one wave episode, but the, the, the model can very naturally generate multiple waves of infection with a, with a slight, slight tweak. So that's in the paper and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna over, go over that today. The first thing I want to compare is um, I want to, to sort of hit the economy with the same infection initially, but vary the structure of financial markets. So the baseline is our model with partial default and lack of commitment, which we, which kind of we, we fit to the Latin American data. And I want to compare that with two other uh, setups for financial markets. The other is financial autarky. That's going to be the red dash line. And I also want to compare with perfect financial markets. You should think about complete markets with commitment. And so the, the, the infection part of the model is the same, but now I'm giving the government much tighter or much looser um, fiscal space in a way. Here in the baseline, the, the constraint comes from their own incentives to default and, and the lack of commitment and so on, the usual problems in, in, in default models. And so what I want to emphasize is that with access to perfect financial markets, the eventual death toll of the the eventual death death toll of the the pandemic is much lower, and that is because endogenously the government can implement much stricter lockdowns for longer, because they 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 will not need to to that that doesn't need to translate into much low into significantly lower consumption. 
right? So what happens in the baseline is that you you are locking down, but you you cannot lock down more because locking down more would would call for you to to suffer much reduced consumption. And so at the margin, you you choose not to lock down more because you are constrained by your your ability to borrow externally. Whereas with perfect financial markets, you're facing a much looser, much looser borrowing limit. So you can borrow more aggressively, support consumption at the, at the, at the same time, mitigate very aggressively. So this is why with perfect financial markets, <clears throat> you're basically eliminating two thirds of the fatalities in the baseline. And just for comparison, you see that even this, you know, fairly imperfect access to financial markets with partial default and so on, it still does much better than, than financial autarky. So there is some benefit from, from accessing international markets uh, compared to, to complete autarky. So that, that makes for a, for a nice comparison. And so going to my last point, you know, you look at this and you think, well, you know, if, if, the, if the sort of your financial conditions are so important in fighting the pandemic, what can we do with official assistance? And there we look at a couple of a couple of programs. One is uh, voluntary restructuring, right? So at the start of the pandemic, we get this uh, uh, we get this unexpected innovation of the pandemic. And what we find is that uh, if we think about the, the the value to the lenders, the market value of that, that's the value to the lenders of having a certain level of debt outstanding out at the start of the pandemic, because of the expectation of partial default and you expect a sort of a lengthy and protracted debt crisis, then um, it is a Pareto improvement for us to just write off some of the debt initially. So voluntarily, the lenders should agree to a reduction of debt to GDP of almost 10%. That will leave them indifferent. But of course, the country benefits greatly from having a 10% reduction in debt to GDP. And of course, if we want to give lenders some, some benefit of this, we don't have to push them all the way to where they're indifferent. We can, re we can reduce that by less and you know, lenders benefit and the country benefit. So in the paper, we discuss a bit wha what are the circumstances under which this voluntary, this one-time voluntary restructuring can make all parties better off. And it relates to this idea of debt overhang and, and this, this laffer curve of the, of the value of debt. So that's one, one thing with, uh, we've been looking at. The other thing I want to mention and then I'm done is we simulate um, official financial assistance. Someone like the IMF gives you 10% of your GDP in a risk-free loan. And that allows you to shift your, your obligations from, from market, market defaultable debt into this uh, risk-free loan with the IMF where we're maintaining the strong assumption that you will never default on the IMF. And so this financial assistance turns out to be very useful because unlike the standard model where it's all about sort of re replacing high interest rate debt with low interest rate debt, here it has benefits on additional margins. You're going to be able to lock down more. You're going to be able to, to save more people. So at the end of the day, we do find a very compelling case for this official, official lending programs because they do they come at the sort of at the perfect time. So if I can extend you this official lending while you're dealing with the pandemic, that's going to be extremely important for, for your outcomes. So, so let, me, let me conclude here because I'm out of time, but what I, I do wanna emphasize is that we do have this joint determination of the pandemic and the, and the fiscal space, and we do have some, some interesting results about their interaction. And I do encourage you to look at the draft for a lot more exercises and a lot more extensions that you, you might find interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. So uh, there is a question from Talisa. Um, the question is, besides IMF, could we also get the financial assistance from the World Bank or WHO or other uh, international organizations in the case of COVID acceleration in extreme ways? So, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that that's that's great. So in, in the model where essentially silent on the identity of who's extending you this this loan, what's essential is that we really have to believe this assumption that you will never default on the official lender, right? So you might you might default on your private sector lenders, but um, we are we are leaning heavily on this assumption that you will not default on your official lender. So so in, in that sense, I think all of these international organizations make for, for 
you know, palatable candidates for this type of assistance. But, and, and I guess it is not true that, I mean, it, 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 we, de, we do see episodes where countries do default on the IMF. So, so that's something to be, to be, to be very delicate. It's, it's a bit of a delicate point here. We have to be careful about, uh, about this assumption. But yeah, I, I think that's a good question. So I think, you know, advanced economy governments or some other organization could provide this, this assistance. And, you know, what our model shows that it, it would be very, very, very productive, especially if you extend this assistance early on in the evolution of the pandemic. You really want you, you really want them to get the money when they need to be very aggressive with their lockdowns and their social distancing. So maybe I can ask a question if it's okay, Chani? Yeah, sure. So um, it's actually a, a couple of questions and thank you for this paper. I think it's very important to, to look explicitly at the trade-offs between the, the health costs and fiscal costs. And uh, this is something that really needs to be discussed. So, so thank you for this paper. Um, I'm thinking, you know, when my questions are probably outside of the scope of your paper, but just kind of thinking through the implications of this. So given the global nature of the shock, um, you know, the, the countries that have normally more access to external uh, financial markets might still not be able to borrow given that there is a shortage of funds globally, right, in a sense. So the cost of borrowing goes up for everybody. And I think in that context, your emphasis on those international organization official creditors is particularly important because that's something that can be um, viewed as outside of the market, right? Because the you know, IMF and the World Bank. And I think from the expectation, you know, from the kind of implication, policy implications point of view, I think this is very important um, uh, direction to think about. Um, in terms of, you know, so, so it kind of a, almost answers my second question. So when you're looking at comparison between your baseline and um, uh, financial, perfect financial markets, right? So we know that some developed countries, you know, normally you would say, okay, U.S. is a, as close as it gets to the perfect financial market, but we know there weren't very strict lockdowns in the U.S. But in Australia, for example, there were very strict lockdowns. So what would be interesting is to maybe calibrate your model to some of those developed economies which have normally an easy access to external financial markets and see, do you get as big of a smoothing of your consumption path in those countries? Because, and if you don't, then is it explained by the global shortage of funding? Because, you know, yeah, they can normally borrow, but there is nobody to borrow from. Um, so I think that, you know, the discussion of the perfect financial markets would be helpful to think in this context. Perfect. No, thank you. That, that's, that's very important. So, right. So I think that really hits a couple of, of things that are, I would say, very much open questions in, in, in this line of work. So kind of going back to your first point. So, I mean, we all have this intuition that if there is, if we have a global shock or like an aggregate shock, then risk-free rates should go up because everyone should want to borrow at that time, right? So if you think about, you know, if all countries have a recession at the same time, then that, that should give everyone an incentive to borrow. And so in equilibrium, interest rates have to be high. But I, so I guess that's not what we saw in the data, right? Because we were, we, we had the same intuition as you, which is when the pandemic hits, we should really see interest rates go up even, even, putting aside the question of default risk and the sort of the premium associated with default. But I think if anything, what we saw is that risk-free rates were quite low and people were actually interested in extent in lending, right? It's like, um, because of course all, all governments borrowed, but then the, I think the private sector more than, uh, wanted to say more than proportional in a way. So I, I guess, I'm not sure if the, if the constraint, if the limited fiscal space in emerging markets was because the risk-free rates were high or it was more because of the, the default risk component. So I guess, so I, I just, I wanna push back a bit on this, on this intuition that I think we all have that 
you know, during a global pandemic, interest rates should be high because I don't think that's what we that's what we saw. But I I I think that's something we should try to make more systematic of an argument. I think that's very important because I think we do have this uh, this expectation that this should be a difficult time for everyone to borrow, including for people in the advanced economies. And and then I guess your your second comment, which I think also is very important, is in this model. You know, if you if 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 I say, well, Latin America is the baseline, and then the U.S. is perfect financial markets, then there's obviously a disconnect because it is not true that the the U.S. or Europe achieved substantially much better pandemic mitigation through harsher lockdowns. And to some extent, we might be able to pick that up in the data, but I think you're right that the in this model, lockdowns are very powerful. And you are getting a lot of, you know, you are you are you are getting a lot of reduction in fatalities by having these very strict lockdowns, which is again, like you mentioned, it's something more like we saw in, in Australia, New Zealand, maybe some parts in Europe. So I guess there's a couple of things I want to say about that. One is, you know, if if the, there is something about the U.S. which perhaps I don't necessarily well appreciate, which is why why in the U.S. things were so so loose in a way, and I, I don't necessarily have any any good insights about that. And and then I I, I do want to point a bit to this literature that they've been thinking more seriously about lockdowns, whether you should make them more targeted, whether you want to have some heterogeneity here. Our model, because we're already dealing with with this default stuff and the segregate dynamics. We couldn't really push a lot this um, sort of the SIR part, and I think people are doing very exciting work with with uh, with heterogeneity in terms of health, age, and so on. And so I think at the end of the day, those factors would be very important in accounting for countries' relative performance. And so uh, I, I think that's something else we should bring into the discussion here. But I think there is a puzzle about why U.S. policy is the way it is. And I think that's a recurring theme that the U.S. is very special in a way. And, and I'm not sure exactly how I would extend this to, to make it a minimal to evidence across, let's say, U.S. states. I think that that's, that's, that's going to be a difficult question going forward. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the comments and discussions. In the interest of time, we need to move on to the next paper. Our next speaker is Masriano Afinito. He will introduce institutional investors' portfolio rebalancing during the pandemic. Uh, so you have 20 minutes. Please share your screen if you want. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? I can hear you, but the screen is not shared yet. No? Oh, maybe yes. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah, okay. Hello uh, again, and uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you, the organizer, for selecting our paper. This is an empirical paper from me. My, my name is Massimiliano Finito and Raffaele Santioni, and uh, uh, we are working at the Bank of Italy. Uh, so the paper is uh, okay. So, okay. The paper is about the um, the investment funds portfolio rebalancing when the uh, COVID uh, nineteen and nine, when the COVID nineteen um, hit uh, the world. Um, investment funds, as you may know very well, have grown uh, substantially since the global financial crisis. Now they hold a large fraction of world savings, purchase and sell securities all over the world, and play a crucial role in the financing of government and firms. Moreover, since the global financial crisis, investment funds um, became um, arrived at the center of the debate because of their intrinsic fragility and the possibility possible implications of their behavior for financial stability. The COVID-19 crisis provided a great opportunity to gain insight into the behavior of investment funds because we can analyze their behavior in response to a real, truly exogenous worldwide shock. And this is 
And this is what we do in this paper. We exploit the pandemic shock to perform a comprehensive empirical analysis of the world IF industry and their behavior and their reaction to the, uh, to the shock. In doing that, we have the advantage of using a unique granular data set that contains more than 12 million observations on fund by fund and security by security sales and purchases during the first four months of 2020 by over to uh, 20,000 investment funds all over the world, located in over uh, 40 countries and investing in more than uh, 100 countries and uh, 20 different industries. So we analyze uh, the effect of the spread of the uh, pandemic on the choices and the, on the uh, portfolio choices of investment funds in uh, virtually all uh, uh, the countries in the world. Exploiting the heterogeneous, uh, how, uh, the heterogeneous effects of the COVID crisis across countries and industries. In fact, as uh, may well known, um, the, the COVID impact was very different across countries, both in the intensity and uh, mainly in the timing of the spread of the pandemic. But it, all, it also was different uh, within countries with, across industries, because, uh, for example, in high tech uh, um, industries, the firms adapted uh, very well to, uh, to social distancing and uh, all the uh, lockdowns uh, uh, requirements. While in other sectors, for example, in the food catering, travel and tourism, this was not feasible. So the effect was very different across countries and the effect was very different across industries. And how the IF reacted to this different effect in the, in the countries and the, in the industries. These are the main conclusion of our empirical work. The pandemic triggered a portfolio recomposition by all investment funds in the world. In particular, investment funds divested from financial assets considered in that moment most troubled. So, uh, in other terms, they divested from the financial assets um, more hit uh, by the COVID uh, impact, both across countries and uh, across industries. Second, we find that uh, investment funds with the more outflows exacerbated the sales. And this indicates that uh, when in, in institutional investors and their unit holders are, um, are hit by the same fear, the uh, likelihood of five sales may become much more likely. Another, um, another result that we, uh, we find in, in our uh, analysis is that uh, the uh, rebalancing was very different, was very heterogeneous by IF category. So this means that uh, investment funds are not all the same. In particular, we find that the investment funds with higher performance do not deleverage, did not deleverage uh, along with the other IFs, they did not herd, did not flock together the other IFs, but uh, had a very different behavior. Another important result of our analysis is that I, IF reacted to the interventions of central banks. And so we, um, we can suggest that there is also a, a, a channel uh, of unconventional monetary policy that acts uh, through non-bank financial institutions. Our paper is related to several strengths of the, of the literature of, on investment funds behavior. First of all, it, our paper is related to the literature that uh, analyzes the behavior of investment funds and their ultimate impact on price development. Is the literature that um, addressed uh, the issues of, uh, such as herding, positive feedback, or trend chasing, and short horizons. This literature typically concludes that the IF tend to destabilize stock prices, in particular during crisis. 
We confirm the results of this literature because we also find that, that uh, investment funds massively sold assets considered the most troubled in that moment. And so in this way, they contributed to increase the likelihood of a fire sales. However, on the other hand, we also find that the IF industry is composed by very different uh, institutions. And these institutions behave very often differently. And their behavior may offset uh, um, the, the behavior of other uh, similar institutions. Then we related to the literature that analyzes the relationship between the sales of institutional investors and their unit holders. And I, I, um, I already mentioned that we, we um, emphasize that when the, the, the fear is contemporary, is, a, is a simultaneous between investors and their unit holders, the, the risk of fire sales is exacerbated. Um, and then, uh, as, uh, as already uh, also mentioned, uh, we contribute to the debate on the policy implication and, uh, um, and the fragility of investment funds, because we, uh, we show that the uh, policy measures taken by uh, central banks, in particular all over the world, influence the, the, the behavior of investment funds. And so this is another channel through which central banks can influence the, um, the economy and another channel through which the unconventional monetary policy can act in the system. So now we can enter uh, the, uh, more in detail the empirical analysis that we uh, carry out. We built a novel granular monthly data set combining several sources. The first important uh, data source uh, for us is the uh, Morningstar um, historical uh, holdings that contain information funds by funds and uh, uh, ISIN by ISIN, security by security sales and purchases during each month of the crisis. And we combined this, uh, this data sort with the uh, centralized securities database of the European system on central banks. We use this centralized uh, database as a, uh, as a register to uh, decrypt uh, and to classify all the icing by icing information that we can obtain through the Morningstar uh, holdings. Then we combine this information with the data that we collect in the, in, during, the, uh, during the, um, the health emergency regarding the impact of the, of the crisis, of the health crisis across countries and across uh, industries. Um, regarding the impact across countries, we use the, the number of, uh, of cases and the number of deaths scaled uh, by the, to the, the total population in each country. Um, the, the number of cases and the number of deaths are, uh, as well known, um, measures um, not complete for, for, for understanding the, the real uh, spread of the, of the health emergency. But however, they, these, uh, these measures are, are perfectly uh, suitable to our purposes because they can capture the point of view of international investors because the number of deaths and the number of cases in each country was the only information that international investors could use to understand how the, uh, the pandemic uh, was um, was hitting each country. Then to understand the, uh, the impact of the crisis of the pandemic across industries, we use the, uh, the recent measures introduced in the labor economics uh, just to, to capture the involvement of each industry in, of each industry in, in the crisis, because these uh, measures capture the, the importance, the relevance of social distancing and the lockdowns uh, for each sector and so for each firm in that sector. Uh, we, um, we use uh, for our analysis uh, two equations. The first equation uh, analyzes the uh, COVID impact in driving the choices of investment funds in selection uh, financial assets by countries. And the second equation make the same work, the same job to, uh, to analyze the, um, the COVID impact in driving the selection of investment funds across industries.
Here I report the, 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 uh, the two equations. The first equation uh, is the dependent variable is uh, um, are the net purchases measured at ISIN level, fund level, and the time level, where time is each month of the crisis. And these are the net purchases scale, uh, scaled um, by the, um, the NAV of the previous period for each fund. The uh, variable of interest, the regressor of interest in the first question is the country COVID. That means the measure of the COVID impact in each country. So the number, in other terms, is the number of, of cases or the number of deaths uh, over the total population of that country. Then we saturate the equation with a large, with a huge amount of uh, fixed effects, of interacted fixed effects, uh, the first one uh, are the interacted fixed effect between funds and time, and the second are the in, uh, interacted fixed effects between uh, sector, between industry and time. These fixed effects remove all other factors that may influence the decision of investment funds different from the COVID impact. The second equation is a specular to the first one. Here, however, the um, variable of interest is the COVID impact across industries. And again, we have, uh, we have saturized the equation through a, a large, a huge amount of uh, fixed effects. We, we are uh, talking about uh, um, 90,000 fixed effects um, interacted between time and funds. And, uh, and, and in addition, other fixed effects interacted between country and time, and time to capture all other factors that uh, may influence the decision of investment funds that is different from the uh, COVID impact across industries. So here is the baseline, um, is the baseline results. Here we have the... Um, the, um, the, our battery, our set of uh, fixed effects. Here we have other uh, control variables that are included uh, at country level, and, the, and these are our variable of interest, the number of cases or the number of deaths over the total population. And in uh, both cases, we can see that the, uh, the effect is negative. And this means that the net purchases decrease when the number of cases or the number of deaths increase. And so uh, investment funds sold mainly financial assets issued by more affected countries. The same result, the, the negative result, we have when we pass to the, um, to the uh, impact across industries. Again, the, uh, the effect of our variable of interest is negative, meaning that the uh, effect that the net purchases decreases, so the, uh, the sales increases uh, when, um, when the industry is more hit by, uh, by the COVID. Here, uh, um, we, um, we make a, 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 a further deepening in these, in these results uh, because we test whether the, um, the uh, disinvestment from the um, financial assets more, COVID, more, um, more hit by the, the COVID, um, uh, we analyze whether this disinvestment is more pronounced when the portfolio is ex ante before the crisis, more COVID-oriented, meaning that uh, the, before the crisis, the portfolio of each investment fund was more invested in countries that uh, then uh, we, um, will be hit by the crisis. And again, we find that the result uh, of, the, uh, of the variable is uh, negative, both uh, across countries and across industries, meaning that um, the most um, COVID-oriented uh, portfolio were more um, were uh, um, were uh, more decreased in in the assets uh, of countries and industries more hit by the crisis. Here in this uh, in these other tables, uh, we show the results uh, splitting our sample in um, country by country results. And here we can uh, see that the uh, result is uh, totally concentrated in the month of March. 
The negative effect is totally concentrated in the amount of March, both across countries and across industries. The negative effect is only significant in, the, in these months, meaning that the uh, adjustment in the investment fund portfolio occurred abruptly in, dot, in that month, while um, during the months of January and February, we, um, we don't see, we don't find um, uh, sales uh, linked to the COVID impact. Very interesting is also the uh, result of April, when we, um, we uh, find that there are uh, seeds of, um, of uh, rebound, both at country level, where we, we see a rebound effect, and at industrial level, where we found a sharp reduction in the decrease of the sales. Here we split our, um, our sample in um, distinguishing the uh, securities uh, on the basis of the residency uh, of the residents of the issues, and we distinguish between non-domestic and domestic securities. And we see that the behavior of investment funds is very similar for the two uh, assets, meaning that uh, investment funds uh, also um, sold their whole country's uh, securities if this mean to rebalance their portfolio toward the uh, less COVID affected uh, portfolio. Here we distinguish our, our um, sample. Um, we split our sample, distinguishing uh, three types of instrument uh, of financial assets. Um, distinguishing between equities, government bonds, and uh, uh, corporate bonds. And uh, uh, we find, very interesting, that the uh, positive effect of April only concern the, cover, uh, the corporate bonds. And this result is very interesting because uh, at the end of March and at the first decades of April, the interventions of central banks all over the world, but in particular in the United States, in the in Euro area, are concentrated just exactly on the corporate bonds. And so the reactions of the investment funds is immediate. Uh, here, uh, we uh, extend our analysis, including a new variable in, in the estimations. The new variable is, the new regressor is, the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, outflows, the amounts of outflows of each uh, uh, investment funds. And here we find that the um, variable, our main variable of interest remains negative in the, in the overall est estimation in the amount of March. Moreover, the, uh, the new variable is negative as well, meaning that the investment funds with more redemptions uh, sold more uh, assets, more financial assets. But uh, what is uh, particularly interesting to our purposes is, is, is uh, verified that the interaction between our variable of interest and measuring the COVID impact and the variable measuring the outflows of investment funds is negative as well. This means that the uh, investment funds with more redemptions also exacerbated the sales, not of all financial assets, but exactly of uh, assets more hit by the crisis. Uh, Massimiliano, sorry to interrupt, but you have one minute left. Maybe you can start right, wrapping up. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I can uh, skip the, uh, some uh, slides. This slide, I think, also is very interesting. Here, we uh, split our sample of investment funds on the basis of their performance in the year before the crisis. And we, um, we uh, split the sample of investment funds in uh, four quartiles of the adjusted returns in the year before the crisis. And here, we uh, find that the, um, the, uh, the first quartiles, the, um, the investment funds with lower performance in the year before the crisis are the funds that decided to, uh, to fail uh, the assets during the crisis. While the only group of investment funds not selling during the month of March and the only group uh, to, to purchase during the month of April are the funds that uh, performed better in the year before the crisis. So it's very interesting to verify that the, um, the investment funds with the, 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 the best performance 
uh, are the found that uh, did not hurt during the, uh, the crisis, uh, during the pandemic crisis, but uh, to have a different behavior from the other, uh, from the other um, investment funds. Then we have a, a lot of, of robustness checks on the other results. Very interesting is this result about equities because about equities we have also other information because we can control for the uh, single data of each issuer of the equity. And uh, we, uh, we, um, and the, uh, our results remain stable also when we control for, for, for the characteristics of each uh, uh, security. Okay, I, I skip all the other, uh, all the other uh, robustness checks that we run on our uh, results, and uh, I conclude with the, the uh, takeaway that I also showed at the beginning of our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you again. Thank you very much. So there's a question from Gabriel. Uh, he asks, besides the case that have been realized, do investment funds take into consideration the expected dynamics of the COVID cases in the future? Uh, Massimiliano, you can see the question directly from the chat window if you want. Uh, sorry, can, can, could you repeat the question? I can't, uh, I can't read the question. Where can where yeah. I read it? So the original wording is that if some of the COVID dynamics are forecastable, uh, meaning that the evolution from infections to death um, may be expected to some extent by uh, the institutional investors, uh, do you think uh, that's going to affect the estimates uh, you provide in your analysis? That is mainly based on the cases that have been realized already. Uh, yes, no, thank you. No, I, I, now I think that I understood the question. Yes, uh, one of the conclusions that we, uh, we, uh, we suggested in our paper is that uh, the, uh, the investors, the international investors, uh, did not uh, forecast the, uh, the crisis uh, uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, one of the results that we emphasize is the fact that uh, the, mm, the sales, the most of the sales, occur only in the, uh, in the month of March when the crisis. Uh, is, um, is uh, evident. While they uh, did not anticipate the sales of the countries or of the industries that, uh, um, that would be more affected by the COVID in the previous months. So the, the, these are, uh, this is the impression that we had on, on the basis of our results. Okay. Thank you. Galina has another question. Uh -huh. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I have one question that maybe is kind of general for this uh, line of research, and uh, I'm not necessarily putting it on you, Massimiliano. Um, so what is really a good measure of the COVID impact, right? Because the number of cases is going to be correlated with testing uh, activity, right? Like whether there is actually random testing or whether it's just uh, symptom-based testing. And as far as I know, the number of deaths, you know, I always think of it as probably the best measure there is because it's the less affected by um, health policies in the countries. But even that, you know, how the deaths are recorded. So for example, in Russia at early stages, they reported very few COVID related deaths because they only recorded the final cause of death like a stroke or a heart attack or respiratory mm -hmm. failure. And they did not necessarily report it as COVID related. And so ex post, we know that it's excess death compared to the historical norms. That probably is the best measure ex post, but obviously ex ante investors did not know these numbers and probably not in March, 2020, nobody really calculated those uh, as far as I know. So I think it's just a general question of you know, obviously it introduces some noise in the estimation, but the concern could be, does it introduce some biases because the number of cases is tends to be smaller in countries that do less testing, right? Like if you think Korea early at the pandemic, they had a lot of cases, but that's because they did a lot of testing. And another question I have is, um, you know, looking at the rebound, I, I thought it was very interesting how it varies by portfolio performance and it kind of makes sense um, I looked at the rebound in exchange rates between March 2020 and say the rest of 2020, and I find a lot of heterogeneity across countries. And I was wondering if you see that, whether some countries 
uh, assets rebounded and some didn't, and whether it's correlated with lockdown measures or fiscal measures or anything that countries actively have done uh, to, to really understand and kind of goes back to Gabrielle's papers, like what, what is the, the cost of borrowing? So I, I'll stop here because we also have a question in Q&A. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Galina. Thank you very much for your questions. I totally agree with you uh, regarding the, um, the measures of the, uh, of, the, um, of the COVID impact. In fact, from a, a, a health point of view, from a medical point of view, absolutely the number of cases, also the number of deaths are absolutely imperfect measures of the real impact of the COVID. However, it was the only information that investors um, were, uh, had in that moment. We are analyzing only the first four months of the COVID uh, widespread. And, and, and so it, it was likely that they, they, they trusted in, in those measures because they, um, they were the only measures that they could use. However, we also, um, of course, we also, um, checked our results using other measures. In particular, we tried with the, um, the measures of each government, the, um, the depth and the length of the uh, lockdowns measures and, and uh, so on, and the results were, were, uh, were confirmed. Mm, however, we, we think that uh, while from a, a medical point of view, these, me these measures are, are particularly imperfect because uh, they depend uh, by, by many issues. Uh, however, for our purposes, we, we, we think that they, they capture the, exactly the point of view of, of investment. Um, while the other, um, the other uh, measures that we used, the impact of the COVID across industries, uh, again, we used uh, um, several measures proposed during these months. Um, we, we prefer the measure uh, proposed by, by um, Karen and, and Petro for, for several reasons that are explained, of course, uh, in the paper, but uh, we also checked with other measures proposed in the literature and, and the results are, are confirmed again also also uh, as for industries. Um, regarding the second question, um, the, re the, the reaction was different, uh, um, was, um, was different uh, by nationality of investment funds, also in, other, uh, also in our results. I didn't show the, the, the table, I'm sorry for the, uh, for the length, uh, <laughs> because I, I, I was too slow in the, in, in the first part of my presentation. However, we, we found a very interesting result that the North American investment funds are the only funds that uh, did not sell the assets more heat uh, during the, the month of March. And this is an interesting result. But uh, what we found particularly interesting is that the rebound effect of April is mainly concentrated in the investment funds from the USA and from the euro area. And uh, since the central banks uh, of these two uh, area was, uh, were the central banks more involved in supporting in particular the corporate bonds market and the disinvestment funds of these two parts of the world in particular invested in, in exactly in corporate bonds, uh, we interpret this result as the, the fact that the central banks had the, the possibility, the option, also the power to influence the investment funds behavior. That's an important result for, the, for, the, um, for, for, for its policy implication. Because our results, in, in, on the one hand, show and uh, confirm that the investment funds are a, 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 a fragile uh, investor because uh, um, when the outflows increase, uh, their behavior becomes uh, um, um, very panic driven. But uh, on the other hand, we also find that the central banks can contribute to, uh, to, to, to balance uh, this, uh, this panic in their uh, behavior. And so the, the results is also comforting in, in a sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Talisa. Uh, are investment funds shifting from stock assets to fixed income assets? And is this driven by increasing uncertainty? I think you already touched upon this, but maybe you can um, provide another brief answer to the question. Um, 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you? Yes, I. Mm, uh, but I, I think that the answer to this question is is, is double, is twofold, because uh, uh, because on the one hand, uh, of, of course, the the effect is driven by uncertainty in the sense that the the, the COVID impact is uh, is uh, basically an impact of of uncertainty, and so I, I totally agree with the, these suggestions about the interpretation of the result. On the other hand, we also find that the effect is different by IF category. So we find that the results are as a, as a partially different, not only on the basis of the, of the performance ability of investment funds, but also on the basis of the policies embedded, of the investment policies embedded in their, in their statute, in their rules, because we find that the reaction was different for equity funds, mixed, um, mixed funds, and uh, income fixed funds. And so we, we think that the, uh, the, the uncertainty is, the, is, the, uh, is a correct interpretation of the results, but this uncertainty is combined differently on the basis of the policies um, followed by the, the investment funds. And this is a, 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 a sure and a possible uh, agenda for future for future um, deepening of uh, for future understanding of, of, of these issues. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, I think it's a good time for us to move on to the next paper. Our next speaker is Okan Saka. He will talk about how epidemic exposure influences financial technology usage. Uh, so Okan, you can share the screen if you want. Thank you very much, and you, uh, let me, can you see my screen? Yeah, great, and you can hear me as well, right? Okay, great. So let me start without taking too much time. Uh, thank you very much for um, including the paper in the session. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and thanks a lot uh, in advance to everyone who may uh, comment on the paper. Uh, we have just actually issued a working paper this week, so we would be uh, you know, great welcoming any comments, any first reactions uh, would be would be very, very much uh, welcome. So let me minimize my camera here on the right hand side. Okay, great. So this is a paper about uh, epidemics, uh, not specifically in the context of COVID, but we are going to go a little bit back to, to the past epidemics. And we are going to look at how people change their uh, behavior, especially when it comes to financial technologies. And then we are going to try to understand how that also depends uh, ex ante differences uh, in the same society uh, across different people. So this is a paper with Barry Eichengreen from Berkeley and Jawad, Jawad Gary Aksoy from EBRD. As always, the usual disclaimer applies, meaning that none of the opinions or thoughts can be associated with the institutions that we work for. So there is this general question, uh, since we have uh, started experiencing the, the, the most uh, uh, recent pandemic, uh, whether or not this pandemic is going to induce shifts in our behavior and whether or not uh, those shifts are going to be persistent, whether or not they're going to be still there uh, after uh, the, the pandemic is gone. So if you go all the way back to maybe to the, to the to most uh, crucial pandemic, uh, in the history of humanity, the Black that uh, in the 14th century, we see that uh, it actually decreased the labor supply by killing so many people. And this has triggered the adoption of capital intensive technologies at the time, such as heavy plow and water mill. So the epidemics have always been associated with very, very structural uh, changes in the, in the technology adoption. In the recent COVID-19 uh, context, we have seen already quite a bit of evidence in terms of, for instance, the pandemic increasing the remote working, uh, also increasing online shopping. Obviously, we have all experienced this personally as well. And also, even in the, in the context of the health services, it has increased people's usage of, of uh, services, these services uh, in, in remote ways through, through telehealth. And obviously, this is very intuitive that social distancing measures and the fear of virus uh, could drive this usage of remote access technologies. The further prediction actually is whether or not these, these uh, technology adoptions are gonna be persistent in the long term. And the, the, the prediction, of course, we cannot uh, see it yet. We are gonna to have to wait maybe for years to come, but the prediction is that it's gonna change the behavior persistently 
uh, especially in those areas where there was already a pre-existing trend. And this we think is, is, is a good context, especially to ask this question in the, in the financial technology domain. So if you narrow that question down, we have several things in mind in this paper. So whether or not the, the epidemics uh, increase remote access technologies with the logic of this social distancing or simply by the fear of, of, the, of the virus and whether it decreases the usage of old technologies such as bank branches, right, in-person technologies. And then the question is whether or not this is gonna affect just the form of these activities or whether it's also gonna have an effect on the overall amount of those activities. Another question will be whether these effects are gonna be in the short term or long term. And of course, the advantage of our setting in this paper is gonna be the fact that we can look at the past epidemic. So we can say something maybe about, you know, what happened after the epidemic was gone, right? So that gives us the chance of to, to have a look at these, like uh, to, to, to speculate about the long-term consequences, even though of course, the past epidemics versus COVID-19 might be a bit, you know, uh, too different to extrapolate fully on. And then lastly, we are gonna look at the role of the local infrastructure and how that you know, determines uh, people's uh, adoption to, to these uh, new technologies. And here uh, we are gonna be, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of articulate what, what I mean by, by this uh, infrastructure and the digital divide. Okay, so what we find just briefly to summarize, we find that epidemics induce a shift towards remote access financial technologies. These are mobile uh, technologies or online payments, uh, mobile bank account usage, and also it uh, creates a shift between old and new technology. So we are gonna see this, especially in people's behavior, shifting from usage of the branches to, to ATMs, which are you know, more remote uh, access technology. And then we are gonna show that we don't really uh, find much of an effect in terms of the amount of activity, but the effects seem to be more about the form of the banking activity change. Okay, and thanks to the fact that we are focusing on the past epidemics, we can actually look at the pre-trends and post-trends after the epidemic is gone. And we do not, first of all, we do not find any pre-trends between countries that were about to be struck by an epidemic and those not, which kind of tells us that, you know, epidemic event occurrence of an epidemic is by itself uh, could be plausibly exogenous. And then when we look at what happens after the epidemic is gone from that country, even though we have a bit of a caveat in this part of the analysis, as we we do not have uh, uh, we do not have a, a repeated uh, cross section in every year uh, in our data set, I'm gonna try to explain it a bit later. But uh, at least, like with with that caveat in mind, we do not really find much of a persistency after the pandemic uh, after the epidemic is gone. And then we look at the heterogeneity in our sample by this new method suggested by Etty uh, Etty and Imbens. And uh, those uh, dimensions, the top dimensions of heterogeneity that determine the heterogeneity in our treatment effects seem to be age, income, and employment. To be more specific, it's the young people, usually between the ages of 26 to 35, and with high income and in full employment, those are the ones that are really adopting to, to, to these remote access technologies. And then when we look at the digital divide, we look at the, at the effect of the local infrastructure uh, uh, we, we measure this in, in various ways, um, and so we, we also uh, call it exante uh, internet infrastructure uh, within the subnational regions of a country. So this is also quite important, as you're going to see. This is going to give us also the chance of you know including further fixed effects, for instance, country interactive country and year fixed effects. This is going to help us to show that actually those regions that were exante better in terms of their inf mobile interest, mobile or internet infrastructure were the ones that were you know, reacting in terms of further adoption of these technologies when the pandemic uh, hit the country. Okay, just a brief uh, summary of the literature. So there is quite a bit of work already that I cannot even fit into the slide uh, in terms of you know, how helpful the financial technology is, how it eases people's uh, lives. Uh, it also helps a lot in terms of, for instance, entrepreneurship and also in terms of financial inclusion by reducing the travel distance, for instance, in the case of debit cards, uh, in terms of increasing formal savings and also, for instance, not only in the, in the, in the, at the level of the individuals, but also further at the level of the banks, at the level of the financial institutions, it helps those institutions to better manage their uh, liquidity through interbank markets and uh, uh, promote uh, more private lending uh, as a result, instead of you know holding on to the cash, uh, I'm not I'm not citing the papers one by one, but uh, there, there's quite a bit of literature on this. So I'm going to be 
try, trying to be a bit uh, quick. Uh, in terms of determinants of fintech ad adoption so far, uh, we have seen, for instance, examples of studies showing how influential the, the social networks are, especially friends and family. And there is a recent work uh, by Chen et al. Uh, from BIS showing that there is also quite a bit of a gender gap. Uh, in the usage of uh, financial technologies. And this gender gap seems to be also partly explained by the, by the country's specific gender norms. Uh, so that's also quite important. And lastly, the trust uh, of, the, of the individuals towards new technologies and uh, also the general trust uh, towards their society determines how much or how quickly they, they will adopt uh, these new technologies. In our context, to our knowledge, there are two studies so far looking specifically in the, in the context of the COVID-19 uh, setting. Uh, the first study by Fu and Mishra, uh, looking at the individuals and how they download banking-related mobile apps in the, uh, after the, after the COVID-19 crisis hit uh, their country. And they show that, that there is an increase in, this, uh, in these mobile downloads. So that's the individual level evidence. And Kuan et al. Uh, looks at the US data and shows that banks that had better IT capabilities, Exante, they were much better in terms of adapting to the, this new uh, situation. They saw larger reductions in their physical branch visits and larger increases in their, in their website traffic. So what we are trying to do is basically to generalize these findings and then you know, uh, extrapolate a bit more to the, to, the, to, the past epidemic, to the setting of past epidemics. So let me tell you a little bit about our data set. We have the main data set as the World Bank's Global Findex. For those of you who may not be familiar, this is probably the largest set of surveys uh, recently started by, by World Bank uh, covering three years so far. I think that the last version is also coming up, 2020 uh, version, I think. Uh, so far we have 2011, 14 and 17 versions, including up to 140 countries uh, where we see each individual's uh, behavior in different domains of, of, of financial activities. Here we focus five questions on five questions that are related to, as we said, remote access technologies. These are about online mobile banking, usage of ATMs, and as an example of, of uh, in-person technology, we also look at the usage of the branches. And as a, as a, as a, as a measure of overall financial activity, we look at five extra questions um, that are measuring, for instance, credit card ownership or deposit activity or withdrawal activity. Of course, all of these additional five questions can be, can, can, can uh, do not specify really a, a usage of a certain technology. For instance, if, if we are talking about depositing, this depositing could also be done online or, or offline. So this is gonna give us a bit of a chance to also see you know, whether the countries that are uh, different in terms of uh, receiving the pandemic and reacting in a certain way in the financial uh, technology domain, whether they are also different overall in terms of their financial inclusion, in terms of their account ownership. And then we, are lucky to have Gold World Pulse because that's the main company to uh, conduct the global FinDEX uh, around the world. Uh, why is that? Because Gold World Pulse also gives a lot of background information for these individuals included in the FinDEX. So that helps us to include many, many controls at the very granular level, at the individual level, including income, exact income levels, labor market conditions, uh, labor market status, uh, age, gender, etc. So we match uh, these two data sets. And then we look at the epidemic occurrences across the world, mainly uh, basing our uh, measure from, uh, from a data set from my et al. Uh, in this data set, we have a long list uh, in the paper. There are almost uh, all the countries that were affected by, a sing by at least one epidemic uh, throughout uh, the, 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 the period from uh, 2000 onwards. So it seems that the epidemics are, uh, are a common phenomenon, at least in the cross section of countries. In terms of the local infrastructure, we look at the, uh, we source the data set, 3G uh, coverage data set from the Collins Bartolomeo. Uh, here we can actually see uh, the 3G coverage at a very granular level. So what do I mean by that? We can see whether a, a, a certain grid the, around the world, a grid by grid, I mean one uh, kilometer by one kilometer uh, grid, whether that grid had a signal coverage on a certain year. Right, so this is also time varying. And then we also have whether that grid had any population, right? And by taking a population weighted average across all grids in a subnational locality, we create an aggregate or, or 3G measure. 
And of course, this data set also gives us the chance to look at the 2G as an alternative, but 2G technology does not really uh, give individuals the chance to, to, to use internet. And obviously this is a almost perfect uh, placebo test to, to show you that it's, it, what matters is actually the 3G or the internet connection rather than the, rather than the 2G uh, general uh, GSM uh, coverage. So here are some uh, uh, summary statistics. I'm not sure how good I am doing in terms of time. I might skip You have five one. minutes left. Oh, I'm gonna be very quick. So you can see some heterogeneity across the world in terms of the 3G coverage here uh, from 11 to 14 and 14 to 17. So our empirical setting is very, very simple. So we have uh, our dependent variables uh, defined as a dummy, whether or not the, the individual is uh, uh, undertaking that financial activity. And then we have obviously the classic country and year fix effects. And we have the main uh, treatment effect as defined as the exposure to epidemic, which is a dummy for a year and a country that uh, you know, shows up as an epidemic in our data set and zero uh, if, if that's not the case. And then at the individual level and also time varying country level, we have many controls uh, that uh, I can uh, describe later. So the first uh, results and the main results are these ones. So you see here five different questions in different panels um, from uh, upper side to the downside. And you have uh, five different specifications at increasing levels of saturation, saturation when it comes to the fixed effects uh, that we include. And what you see here across all specifications and across um, all questions, you see the significances, but of course, I need to uh, also tell you a little bit about what these questions are to tell you the direction, of, to, to be able to tell you about the direction of the effect. So the first three questions are about the internet usage, internet and account usage of these individuals. So the financial technology usage. And the last two questions are actually the usage of all technology, relatively all technologies, ATM versus bank branch. And ATM here obviously proxies the usage of uh, remote versus uh, bank branch representing the usage of in-person in -person technologies. What we see here is actually that these online technologies are increasingly being used when the epidemic hits a country. And when we compare the all technologies, actually there is almost a perfect switch uh, perfect substitution between the usage of the ATM and the bank branches. So the usage of the ATMs increase and the usage of the bank branches in terms of money withdrawals uh, decrease when the pandemic hits a country. When we look at the, at the overall financial activity, or you can define this as the financial inclusion uh, in those countries hit and not hit by the epidemic, the difference is we see no effects here. So these are not only insignificant results, but these are almost precisely estimated zeros, as you can see. So there is no difference in terms of account ownership between those countries hit and not hit. Uh, there is no difference in terms of deposit activity or overall withdrawal activity uh, across those countries. So here I need to uh, explain to you what we are doing. As I told you that we have three different years, 2011, 14, and 17. So we cannot really trace the same epidemic across different years because we, our data set does not allow that. But what we can do is we can re-estimate our main specification by looking at those countries that had any other epidemic in the previous year or two years before, or that is about to receive an epidemic in the next year or two years later, right? So by doing that, we create an event study setting. But again, just to repeat it, there is a caveat here because we are not really tracing the same epidemic over time. And what we find is actually our effects only show up during the pandemic year and they do not really show up before or after. So you can interpret that, especially the pretrends, as, as kind of showing that there is, uh, there is uh, some reality in the, in the exogeneity assumption that we make about the epidemic show. And then quickly just uh, showing you that it, when we divide the epidemics in our sample into intense ones and low intense ones, high and low, we see that the effects are mainly driven by the intense uh, epidemics uh, that are killing more people or that are affecting more uh, cases in those countries. Uh, and then we do some falsification tests where we randomize either the country, uh, randomly choosing another country from the same continent, or we also randomize the epidemic year that hits that country. Uh, and again, we, we, we don't really have uh, much. So some robustness checks that I'm gonna skip given the time constraints and coming to the, coming to the heterogeneity analysis, uh, when we, include all our dimensions into this, into this causal forest method, the three most important dimensions that come out of the method is 
household income, employment, and age. And when we divide our sample in, into subsamples in those, in those domains, we see that it's mainly, as you can see in terms of the income, it's mainly the high income individuals and also the individuals that are uh, in full employment and the individuals that are uh, between 26 uh, and 35 age uh, year old age uh, individuals that are that are really picking up uh, the main uh, treatment effects. Here, as a, I hope I was not too fast, but uh, I, I, I think I'm almost made it to the end. So here, uh, what we are trying to do is now to look at the effect of the infrastructure on top of the epidemic occurrence. So we interact or 3G variable in the first panel, right? Uh, to understand what happens, especially those regions that are better covered by the, by the internet, by the 3G internet. But of course, one could say that, you know, this 3G internet it, in itself might be affected by the epidemic occurrence. So it may not be a very good way. So what we do is we also create a simple dummy instead of using the continuous epidemic, uh, continuous 3G coverage measure, we create a simple uh, dummy to, to look at the above median and below median 3G, just to make it a little bit more exogenous, right? Uh, compared, to the, compared to the epidemic experience. And lastly, what we do in the last panel is that we only take the initial 3G uh, uh, values for each subnational region, uh, which makes sure that it, they do not really respond to the uh, occurrence of the, of the epidemic. So what, uh, across the uh, panels, you can see that uh, the effects are much higher when the epidemics uh, occur in regions, uh, in, uh, in regions that, that have better 3G coverage. And most important, I think the thing that I need to emphasize is this last specification here, which we include also country year fix effects. This, we have a chance to do that because our 3G measure uh, is subnational. And even here, you can see that, uh, or, or exposure to epidemic uh, dummy drops, but uh, our main effects for the interaction uh, stay quite stable. So here, just a quick placebo check to show that 2G does not really matter. Um, and then some event study results that, I, that are again showing that the effects are mainly occurring in the, in the pandemic year and not any other time. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry for rushing a bit too much. Uh, we show that in this paper that past epidemics led to higher usage of remote access banking technologies and also a switch between the old technologies, albeit uh, that these effects seem to be temporary, at least for the, for the context of the past epidemics. Epidemic-induced reaction is mainly driven by young, high-income uh, individuals that have full employment. So this also uh, says a little bit more in terms of you know, how individuals, which individuals adopt to, 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 to the new technology and how pre-existing inequalities in the society may, may actually uh, determine our uh, flexibility. Um, and lastly, we show that better exante local 3G infrastructure actually uh, helps individuals to, to, to shift uh, to the new technologies uh, and to adapt uh, as a response to the pandemic. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to all the questions. Thank you very much, Akin. Any questions or comments from the audience? Uh, just a friendly reminder, you can always use the Q&A function if you have any questions. Um, if uh, you don't have the question for now, uh, you can type in uh, the question you might have and I can direct the question to Alkan later on. Um, so maybe we can move on to uh, the next paper. Our last speaker is Sisa Sosa um, Padilla. He will examine sovereign debt restructuring in response to COVID. So Sisa, you can share the screen if you want. Thank you. Okay, thanks for um, organizing this and for having our paper uh, in the program. Uh, this paper is called Sovereign Debt Standstills and is joint work with um, Juan Carlos Cachondo from the uh, uh, University of Western Ontario and Leo Martinez from the IMF uh, and, and this guy. Uh, since, since Leo is in the IMF, I have to say that this, uh, it's, this is uh, just our views and uh, should not be attributed to the IMF, its executive board management. Uh, uh, it's 
this is just us. And, and actually today, this is just uh, my opinion. Okay. Um, so the motivation for our paper, um, we can we can motivate the paper either either as a response to COVID or or even uh, things that were happening uh, you know before COVID. So as a response to to the COVID nineteen crisis, the G twenty agreed on a sovereign debt standstill to the to the poorest countries. Okay, and what the standstill consisted on or consists on the proposal is on a debt service suspension. Okay, that's that's sort of the first. Uh, uh, element of the proposal. And an important qualifier on this proposal is that this service suspension goes without haircuts, okay? Uh, and, they, and then this, this G20 proposal then um, uh, got sort of amplified, if you want, by, by other academics and, and policymakers to try to include uh, not only the official creators, which were in the initial G20 proposal, but also to include private creators and to extend this not only to the poorest countries, but also include middle income countries. Okay? So this idea of, of uh, introducing a standstill is similar to, uh, uh, to uh, sort of some principles underlying previous uh, uh, debt restrictions. Okay? Um, even absent the COVID crisis, one can think of uh, this idea of, of a standstill to be related to, to sort of the, uh, the, the modus operandi of, of uh, Reprofiling the debt before engaging, before actually going into an IMF program, okay? and 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 also we, we uh, one can think of of bond covenants that include this this uh, standstill as sort of a uh, triggering a result of some shock. Okay, so what we want to do in this paper is to quantify the effects of. This proposal. So we quantify the effect of a one-time debt relief uh, after a negative shock. Okay. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use the simplest sovereign default model with long-term debt. Right. In particular, we're going to be uh, comparing two strategies for debt relief: these standstills that, that became sort of popular around uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, and a more sort of usual approach of, of uh, doing haircuts. What we find is that standstills create welfare gains for the sovereign, that is for the borrower, uh, but generate capital losses for the creditors. Okay? This finding is consistent with the creditor's reluctance to participate in this, in this uh, uh, standstill proposal. Okay? We also show that implemented standstills uh, create a, sort of, uh, a form of debt overhang and therefore open up opportunities for something that we call voluntary debt exchanges in, in some previous uh, uh, paper of ours, uh, which is exactly uh, um, uh, similar to, to uh, um, uh, something Gabriel was talking about earlier, right? So those are, find those are our findings regarding stances. Regarding haircuts, what we find, and, and, and I'm trying to uh, convince you, is that haircuts uh, have the possibility of generating uh, gains for both uh, borrowers and lenders, so sovereigns and, and international creditors. So our, our punchline is going to be that debt relief policies or debt relief strategies that, uh, uh, that don't include haircuts do not seem to be a, a good idea. Right. So I'll, I'll go um, um, directly to the model. Uh, um, since I only have 20 minutes, I'm going I'm to try to be quick. But let me tell you that uh, our, our approach here is to take the simplest possible framework uh, that has allows for default and for long-term debt. Okay, this to this uh, uh, simplest framework, we can add many bells and whistles, and and some we did in the paper, and I'm going to tell you that uh, results are robust to that. Uh, but but the, the sort of um, the the nature of the exercise is to take this the, the most simple uh, sort of framework that this literature has been thinking of. And so this is an equilibrium model of default. Uh, following Eton Gersowit and, and other people with long-term debt. Okay, so essentially this is a stochastic uh, exchange economy. The economy receives an endowment uh, every period. Why? Uh, so the log of Y follows this AR1 process. That's the only source of uncertainty uh, uh, in the model. Okay. The objective of the government 
Uh, so we're going to be thinking also as a real deal of a consolidated problem. The government is choosing allocations uh, for the residents. The objective is to maximize the uh, utility, and, and the utility you know, is CRA. There's nothing uh, sort of new there. Now, the borrowing opportunities, this, the, 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 the country is going to be able to borrow against uh, competitive risk neutral lenders uh, <clears throat> using non state contingent long term bonds. Okay, so these bonds are perpetuities with geometrically decreasing coupon obligations. Uh, so if a country issues a, a bond in period T, then that bond pays in T plus one, pays one, in T plus two, pays one minus delta, T plus three, one minus delta square, and so on. So this allows us to have uh, long-term uh, uh, bonds uh, without increasing uh, uh, the dimensionality of, this, of the state space of the problem. This is a, a common approach. Regarding defaults, what we assume is that the government is able to default, so it cannot commit uh, to, to its, to its uh, debt and default policies. And if it defaults, it will not pay any current or future obligations. So we're assuming a total wipeout of the debt. Okay? So if a default event starts, then there's a probability uh, psi that it ends at some point. So psi controls the duration of the financial exclusion. Okay? Uh, so in default, a government cannot borrow. Also, while the government is in default, its income is reduced by phi of y. And this is uh, sort of the cost of, of defaulting, uh, one of the costs of defaulting, the other one is exclusion. And, and that, that phi of y is going to essentially depend on two parameters, uh, which, which we're going to calibrate. Okay. So the entire model in, in one slide uh, is this. So a government that starts a period in good standing and has debt level B and income Y has to decide whether to default or not. Tradition, following the tradition and different from Gabriel, our default decision is binary. So it's you either uh, repay, so that's D is zero, or default D equals one. If you if a country defaults, then what happens is this, it just gets excluded, so it's cons it consumes Y minus the cost. So whatever is left after the cost gets consumed. And tomorrow, as I said, there's a probability side that the country re-enters with zero debt, or one minus side that the country remains excluded. Now, if the government repays, then it has to choose uh, a new level of debt, right? And it's going to consume uh, all of this, which I'm going to explain what it is. So Y is the income, B is the debt repayment, okay, or the, the coupon payments. And then that's what I have here on, on, on the square brackets is the debt issuance. So it's this, uh, this is the debt level for tomorrow minus the debt level of tomorrow that would be the clearing level if I issue nothing, right? So B prime minus one minus delta B is the new issuance. And those trade at the price of Q. Okay? So the government borrows, uh, decides how much to borrow and repays and consumes uh, the net of all of that. And tomorrow there's, there's, there's continuation value and expectations over Y. So these bonds are traded against international lenders, uh, which uh, happen to be risk neutral in the model. That's not critical. We could add risk aversion and uh, this, this will go through. And, and the price is characterized by this equation here, which essentially is the discounted repayment probability. So this is the probability that tomorrow the country repays. And if that happens, the investor gets one, that is a coupon payment plus one minus delta of the bond is still alive, and it has a market value given by this Q here. Where you see this Q depends on the optimal policy of tomorrow. So the price depends on uh, how much uh, uh, borrowing is uh, decided. Okay. So the model is essentially those four equations. Uh, and, I, and let me reemphasize this is the standard, uh, as standard as it gets uh, for sovereign debt model uh, with long-term debt. Okay. Uh, just in case uh, you're wondering, if, if you make delta equal to one, then the model collapses to one to one period of debt. Right? What are we going to do with this model? We're going to calibrate it uh, to to an, uh, sort of a typical emerging economy like Mexico. The calibration is going to be frequently. Essentially, we want to do nothing new here. We want to use our previous work to calibrate this model. Right? Uh, so all the parameters above the line are either standard or estimated directly. And this last two parameters, which are the, uh, the ones that affect the cost of default, are calibrated so that we hit two targeted moments, the mean debt level and the mean spread. Okay? 
So let me show you first that the model uh, uh, fits the data quite well here on the, on the targeted moments and also in the non-targeted moments as excess uh, consumption volatility, uh, countercyclical spreads, uh, countercyclical trade balance, and so on. Okay. So from this, I want to say here's a model or here's a, a, a theoretical structure that's sort of standard and, and, and it, we think it's a, it's a reasonable laboratory to think about that relief policies. Okay. So now let, let me talk about the exercise. Right. So we are going to think of shocks of three sizes. I'm going to do the presentation mostly around the large shock, but let me say, say a, a bit more. So it's going to be an endowment shock, which is the only shock in the economy. And we're going to analyze what happens at the mean that level, which was 44% of GDP. Okay. So we're going to sort of measure the size of the shock by the effect that it has on, on market access. Okay. So we can think of a small shock that, that increases spreads by 250 basis points. So that's roughly what happened uh, in Mexico and other emerging economies that, that preserve us market access, uh, at, at least at the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, a large shock, uh, that's kind of what happened to uh, uh, sub-investment grade countries, uh, some, some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that uh, observed uh, um, spreads increasing by a thousand basis points. And then a third type of shock that we're going to call the default triggering shock, uh, that is the size of this endowment shock that makes the country default if there is no debt relief, but such that if a debt relief strategy is imposed, the country prepays. Okay? So that's, that's the idea of these three different sizes of the shocks. And what is, what's the stand still in the model? The stand still is an agreement by which there are no debt payments for some periods. Okay? Uh, and during this, this periods in which the government doesn't have to service the debt, the government can borrow or can buy back debt. So that's uh, access to uh, uh, markets. Okay. And those uh, uh, coupon payments that are uh, suspended get to grow at a rate uh, uh, that we're gonna call RDS. And this rate is gonna be a combination of the risk free rate plus the average spread uh, in the model. Okay, so this is something that we think First of all, that it wasn't the proposals, and second, that it's, it's supposed to capture some fair compensation for the for the lenders that see their their, their uh, coupon payments uh, push. Okay, now uh, what we're going to see is that implementing these standstills create capital losses for the creators, and the capital losses are, are measured as the percent decline in the market value of their debt. Okay. And the market value of the debt is measured by precisely these two equations here. It's the initial level of debt multiplied by the repayment decision. So if the government defaults, the market value becomes zero. And then it's the coupon plus the continuation value. Okay? And that's the first equation is the market value of the debt in normal times, meaning without a standstill. And the second equation is with a standstill, where the only the important modification is that there's no coupon payment because the standstill suspends the coupon, and the face value grows at this uh, rate, RDS, okay? So with this framework, we ask the question, what is the best debt strategy uh, or debt relief strategy for a given creator loss? So imagine that we agree that different strategies could implement some creator losses, uh, which doesn't need to be positive, could be zero or negative. Uh, so for a given uh, uh, creator loss, what is the best way of go going about this debt relief strategy? Okay. I'm going to focus on the large shock. As I said, a large shock, happened, a large shock, shock has an effect on, on market values. This is what I'm showing here. Uh, so the golden line, this one is for if there's no shock. The black line is if the big shock happens, the large shock happens, and, and there's no relief uh, strategy. And the other three lines are for what happens to the market value of debt with a standstill that lasts for one year, two years, or three years. Okay. So immediately what you can see here from going from the no policy to the say one year standstill is that the market value at the mean debt level, 44%, goes down. Okay. So what we see. Is what I'm what I'm plotting here now, and the graph now looks weird, but then I'm going to populate the graph. 
are possible combinations of capital losses and welfare gains. So capital losses for the lenders, welfare gains for the sovereign. If we implement a standstill that lasts one year, two years, or three years, and all of these are compared to the do nothing approach, that would be zero. Like, don't do any debt relief strategy. Okay? What we see is that, say, doing a, a standstill of a one e of a one year gives delivers positive welfare gains for the uh, sovereign, but positive capital losses, so uh, 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 tough back for the uh, for the creditor. And the, the gains for the sovereign are increasing in the length of the stancil. Okay. So what happens in this, this stancil? What happens is that the spread increases either without the policy or with the stancil. Uh, and the debt during the stancil goes up because the, the, the missed payments are automatically rolled over. Okay. So what we see is that uh, essentially, uh, since the bond price collapses more, uh, then the market value of that uh, uh, sort of falls more with the one-year standstill compared to the no um, relief strategy. Okay. What I'm going to show now is that starting from this point, the one-year uh, standstill. Let me think what happens if I combine that with haircuts, and haircuts are reductions in the nominal value of that. Right. So what I'll do is I'll draw another graph here. Uh, to show what happens if I combine this one one year stencil with a haircut, right? and what we find is uh, the following, right? So if I combine it now, each now each dot on the on the on the blue line is an incremental seven percent haircut, right? So one, two, three dots. So being here, this is like this is roughly a twenty one percent haircut, which is the one uh, that minimizes the capital losses. Okay, so starting from this point here. There is essentially an agreement zone, which is everything that I'm highlighting here. And in that agreement zone, there are Pareto gains, right? Everyone gets better off. Capital losses are minimized and welfare gains are increasing. Okay? Now, from this point onwards, then we have sort of a conflict zone, if you want, or a disagreement zone, in which uh, with larger haircuts, the sovereign keeps winning. And, and, and the and the um, uh, the lenders start sort of losing, right? Okay. So immediately from here, I can make a point in case I run out of time. Even just doing this, this is for the large shock, remember, but sort of holds true for uh, the other shocks. Immediately, it's obvious here that doing a one-year standstill without haircuts is a bad idea because we can improve. We can have Pareto improvements by combining standstill. Uh, with haircuts, okay? and all of this is due to the to the sort of uh, to to the fact that the shock and the standstill put the economy on the wrong side of the debt curve. That's where entire intuitions come from. Okay, let me skip this thing. Now, what I want to do is start from the graph I just used and complete the graph. Okay, um, what I'm going to show is what the slide says. If I can choose freely, then only using haircuts. Is the best policy. Okay, so now I do this. I add haircuts to the all all the possibilities to the one year standstill, to the two year, three year, and to the zero year standstill. So just haircuts. And we can see is that this black line here is sort of an envelope of the other ones. So uh, uh, doing only haircuts seems to be the best option here. One point to to also mention is that if for some other reason. Some, some unmodeled reason in, in, in this story. Uh, using Stanfield is either politically uh, good or, or, or desirable in some other way. Then the losses that come from, from uh, implementing the Stanfield are very small if the haircuts are already large. Okay? What I mean is that uh, these two lines and these three lines here are very close to each other. Okay? So if the financial, if the international financial system uh, needs to implement uh, Stancils, then uh, doing that together with large haircuts uh, uh, sort of minimizes the, the, the inefficiencies from the stencil. Francisca, you have two minutes. Maybe you can start okay. writing up. Okay, I'm going to wrap up by saying that this uh, idea that only haircuts is the best option holds for all the other sides of the shock. And, and, uh, uh, and to know that in the trigger default shock, uh, a standstill is mutually beneficial precisely because avoids a default. Uh, but even then, 
uh, using haircuts is, is superior. Okay, the intuition for our results is very simple, I, 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 I think. After a negative shock, the price of the debt becomes very sensitive to changes in the debt level. And a standstill and a haircut essentially move the debt in opposite directions. A haircut reduces the debt, that creates a sharp increase in, in the price, so the market value of the debt goes up. A standstill increases the debt afterwards because postponed payments earn interest. Okay? And that, since the debt is already, since the price of the debt is already very sensible, drops the, uh, the price. Okay? And this is, this is essentially the, 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 uh, the intuition for, for why the, the two go like in opposite directions. Let me tell you, and with this I'm going to wrap up, that our results are uh, robust to modeling uh, the shock in a different way. So, for example, modeling uh, the shock this way, there is more of a U shape. Okay, uh, the results go through with that. Uh, the results go through if we add a sudden stop or if we allow for positive recovery rate. This is, this is currently in, in the appendix of the model, but may soon become the, uh, the main version. Okay, and also modeling the crisis as a dead shock, which is something I, uh, I don't have in the slides today. But, uh, so it, it carries through to these uh, uh, modifications. Okay, so let me conclude and say standstills without haircuts do not seem to be the best form of debt relief. Okay, uh, they, the standstills create this debt overcome problem and therefore make a bigger room for, uh, for, for implementing haircuts. Okay? So if, st if the standstills without haircuts are favored because of some regulatory cost, say some, some lender aversion to haircuts or, or say for the doctrine of necessity, then uh, what, we, what the paper is showing is that the inefficiencies that are triggered by these uh, regulations uh, appear to be significant. Thanks. And I, I saw some questions in the chat that I didn't, I couldn't yes. monitor. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Cisa. So there's a question sure. from Gabriel. Uh, so his question is, what happens at the end of the standstill? Uh, do the payments get resumed? And is yeah, there sorry. any seniority? Yeah. Yeah, 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 sorry, Gabriel. I should have explained that better. At the end of the standstill, payments get resumed. And what, what we are assuming is that every, every new debt that is issued during the standstill uh, inherits the standstill. So say you have a standstill for two years and in quarter two, you issue new debt. Well, that new debt is not gonna pay uh, coupons until all the sort of the legacy debt starts paying coupons. So in that way, uh, I don't need to keep track of I, I, I don't have an extra state value. I don't need to keep track of the old legacy debt and the debt issued during the standstill. So after the standstill, uh, um, only then payments resume. I should also have said that if during the standstill the government decides to default, which is a possibility, then the standstill goes away. Like then, 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 then we're moved back to the, uh, to, 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 to the model without standstill. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question about the model. I was wondering whether you might be interested in making the duration of the standstill an indulgence variable, for instance, based on the objective function of the creditors, or in this particular situation, the dynamics of the pandemic. Yeah, so if you can see, so what would be, let me just show you this, uh, this graph, but um, um, we, saw, we saw this for, for different possible durations of the standstill. Uh, um, what you can see here is that essentially uh, uh, this, this result is, is true, that the, the longer the standstill is, uh, the better off is the country and the worse off is, is, the, is the lender. So um, kind of trivially here, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm providing too, tri too trivial of an answer, but from the, from the point of view of the, of the country, the, the longer the standstill, the better. Uh, um, uh, so they yeah. don't. I we never we never we never get to see say uh, I'm gonna draw on top of this, but we never get to see say uh, situations that are like this, where the country starts preferring you know uh, uh, shorter shorter standstill. Uh, yeah. One thing, one I mean, it's an endowment economy, right? So, um, so the uh, you you could think that. Uh, um, this also affects capital accumulation and productivity in other ways. So may, maybe in those cases, the country would prefer to sort of restrict the duration of the, of the stance. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Any more questions or comments from the audience? OK, 
Okay. Uh, if not, I would like to thank all the speakers again for their excellent talks. I also want to thank everyone here for attending this session. So hopefully I can see you around in other sessions and take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.